let's continue our discussion on projection theorem today again the idea is we want to run gradient descent type of algorithms over a convex set and there is a real possibility that while you are running gradient descent you might step out of the convex set in which case you need to project the point back onto the convex set okay and so the projection is defined as argument of z minus x square two norm where x is in capital x okay so if you want to project you are essentially trying to solve an optimization problem but it turns out that for many uh, many classes of problems or many classes of sets convex sets projection is a very easy operation so let's look at a box so this is something that i've noted in the previous class but i want to write it again so if you have box constraint so a is my set capital x is such that a is less than equal to x is less than equal to b and so it could look something like this is a box okay so these are box constraints a would be the coordinates of the point here and b would be the coordinate of the point there now the projection is defined as zi if ai is less than equal to zi is less than equal to zi ai is zi is greater than ai zi is less than ai and zi is zi is greater than zi okay this is the i s so this is the i s coordinate of the system so from this we can immediately infer that if x is the set such that x is greater than e all negative coordinates will be uh, made equal to 0 so d plus i is such that its zi if zi is greater than equal to 0 0 if zi is strictly less than zero. okay and this is cone and it looks something like this any question so far okay now the third set would be sphere x norm of x is less than equal to r and this is n2 norm in which case the projection is r multiplied by z over norm of z if norm of z is greater than r and z if norm of z is less than equal to r well this is not the definition of definition of projection is right here okay this is what the solution turns out to be of that optimization problem now 
Now, the question you might ask is whether, what's the proof of this particular result? Well, actually proof by picture is pretty easy to see. This is your sphere, this is your center, this is the origin. Here is your point Z. So at what point is Z going to satisfy? So at what point, so let's say this is my X star, which is Z plus. So these three points have to be in the straight line. Okay, so this is the point at which, no matter which point you take, x1, x2, so this is the point at which x minus x star transpose z minus x star is less than or equal to zero. This is your z minus x star. Okay, so that if you move it a little bit on this side or that side, then you will see that there is a di direction at which this thing can become positive. Okay. So let's look at the complexity of projection for these problems. Very simple. Okay, you just have to check if condition and then uh, the projection is done. This is also fairly simple, okay. In fact, people in neural network use this a lot, okay. If you're, uh, if you're going to do research in deep neural network, this is something that appears every now and then. This is also fairly simple. Uh, you do have to compute the norm of the vector and then you have to multiply it by R, so that's a scaling. And that's a simple operation depending upon how big your, uh, what's the dimension of the vector z is. Okay, now if your set is not one of these, and I'm gonna cover one more example which is the subspace case. But if your set is not one of these sets, then certainly projection becomes a difficult operation. And then you may want to use some other method which doesn't require projection. Okay. Of course, we haven't yet used projection in any of our any of the algorithms, but uh, we'll get to it uh, in today's class. Any question? Okay, so the next projection I want to do is for the case where x is a subspace, so it's given by the set of all x as that ax equal to zero. A is in our m cross n, m is less than n, and what else? m, so a is of rank m. So A is full rank. So what would this look like? This is a so this is my three-dimensional space. So this looks like a hyperplane. It could either be a hyperplane or it could be a ray, or not a ray, but a line passing through the origin. Okay, so I just draw it like a hyperplane because it's easier to visualize but it could also be a line passing through origin. So that's my subspace X. And I have a point, let's say minus C, and I want to project minus C onto the space, onto this subspace, capital X. So can someone help me with the formulation of the optimization problem? What would the optimization problem look like? So my z is equal to minus c, and I want to project it, so 
z plus is argument x in capital X minus c minus x square. Okay. Now note that this is equivalent to this problem is equivalent to argument x in x norm of c plus x square two norm. So how do I, yeah? Didn't we already cover something that could be a, used for this with, a, um, it was the generalization on Graham Schmidt, you know, the, no, no, no. Uh, um, orthogonalization process is over A. Couldn't that be used to then approximate A, this? No, I don't know how you would do that. We did cover this as part of projection theorem, but I don't know if you're referring to that or you're referring to something else. Okay, so how do we go about solving it? So what, any question? Okay, so what did projection theorem say? It said that if you have a subspace, if X is subspace, then then x star is equal to z plus if and only if z minus x star transpose x is equal to 0 for all x in capital X. Okay, so this is my z minus x star is this particular vector and that has to be orthogonal to any other vector x on this plane. So these are x1, x2, x3, x4. So how do we go about solving this problem? Any ideas? So we want to solve this problem. We have a projection theorem which says, I mean we covered it in the previous class, which says that uh, x star is a projection of z if it satisfies this expression for all possible x. Any thoughts? Yeah. Um, if the difference between z and x star is orthogonal to the uh, vector that's been in our space of A, then it should be uh, mm -hmm. orthogonal to the uh, space of A. Right. Yeah, that's one way to solve it. Okay. Uh, it's a bit complicated way to solve it because it requires understanding of what would be in the null space of A, okay? So, 
okay so yes that is one way to solve it the other way to solve it is using constraint optimization uh, sorry using lagrangian method which again something we have not studied so far okay so let's try to uh, and, and you will and you will solve this problem using constraint optimization later on okay using an assignment it's it's an extremely simple problem to solve once you know what lagrangian methods are and what KKD conditions are, okay? But we'll get to it in a few days, few weeks from now. But at this point of time, one way to solve it because of this if and only if condition is if someone gives me a value of x star or a function of x, uh, a value of x star, and then all we need to check is that x star satisfies this condition, okay? So let's pick up the solution from the book, which says that x star should be minus identity minus a transpose a, a transpose inverse a c. Okay, so this is the claim. How do we check whether this is indeed a solution or not? So, okay, Matthew came and gave me this solution. Okay, I think x star should be equal to this expression. How would I check whether this is indeed true or not? Any thoughts? Sorry? Plug it in here. Is that all that I need to check or there's something more I need to check? Yes. Uh, but one thing is hidden here, the fact that x star should be in x itself, okay? So that's also something I need to check. So somebody gave me this expression, I don't even know whether this lies in the set capital X or not. So that's something I need to check. So, so the first thing I want to check is that x star lies in capital X. So let me multiply. All I need to check is a, a multiplied by x star is equal to zero. So I have minus a c plus a transpose, no, a a transpose, a a transpose inverse a c. Okay. And since A has rank M, this is identity. So the inverse, so this is just the inverse, this is just the inverse of this matrix, so that's identity, and that's equal to zero. Okay, and the second part that I need to check is this expression. minus c minus x star transpose x equal to zero. So let's try to find what c plus x star is. That is c minus c plus a transpose a, a transpose inverse AC. Okay, and I can I can erase these two terms, and then all I have is this expression, and all I have to do is take the transpose of this, multiply it by x. So I get C plus X star transpose X equals C transpose A A transpose inverse A X.
what is the value of this? All I have to show is that this expression is equal to zero. Okay, so my question is, it looks like a pretty complicated expression. How am I going to show that it's equal to zero? Sorry? AX equal to zero. What kind of property did you use in order to conclude that this entire, so since AX equal to zero, remember X lies in capital X, capital X means AX is equal to zero. So one of your colleagues claimed that this is equal to zero, therefore this entire expression is equal to zero. Can you tell me what property did you use? Yeah, that's, that's true, but uh, there is a property of matrix multiplication that you're using here. Yeah, so it's ABC equals ABC, right? If you have three matrices of uh, appropriate dimensions, then AB multiplied by C is same as A multiplied by BC, okay, associativity property. And so we use that here to conclude that this whole term is actually equal to zero because AX is actually equal to zero. Yes? So why did we use negative C? Negative C? In, in the original formulation of the problem, why did you pick? Yeah, so I will, I'll get to it. it. It has a very nice looking expression, that's why. Okay. okay. Uh, I would have personally preferred to take C and not negative of C, but since the book has negative of C, I'm just using negative of C so that you don't get confused. So anyways, we, we check the two conditions and therefore we conclude that X star given by this particular expression is indeed a solution to this problem. It's the projection of minus C onto this subspace. Okay, now how do you get this expression to begin with? We'll cover it when we talk about KKD conditions in the future. Any questions so far? What's the complexity of computing this projection? Okay, so depending upon the matrix, what this matrix A looks like, this computation could be pretty intense, okay? Uh, so A A transpose is a matrix in M M cross M, right? So even if X is a million dimensional, as long as M is a low dimension, 5, 6, 10, 15, 20, computing the inverse is not a problem. Multiplying these matrices could be a problem right and then everything else uh, is pretty simple okay so this kind of projection is somewhat more complicated and requires a little bit more computation than other projections that we have seen in this uh, in today's class any questions so far yes so that, um, this is what I was trying to get at. That equation is effectively a geometric equation uh, from, so to make it look like you're really around. Mm -hmm. And so now we're using that as a solution to an optimization problem. Yes. So what's the value in this case of casting a projection as an optimization problem? There's no, there's no function for us to take a derivative of, there's nothing like that. So why are we saying it's an optimization Well. First thing, this particular expression comes from the necessary and sufficient condition for optimality, right? So that's one reason why we pose this as an optimization. Well, projection, first of all, projection itself is defined as an optimization problem. It's not, there's no other way to define a projection. This is the only way, right? And then we use the theory of optimization to come up with this sufficient condition, right? 
All now we need to check is whether that sufficient condition is satisfied for this particular expression or not. Any other question? Yes. Um, is there uh, an approximation method for or that calculation like there was in the uh, uh, conjugate direction method we covered earlier? Oh, that's a hard question. I don't know. Well, if, if well how do you, how do you, in, so what is the problem here? You have, well, okay, let's, let's try to think of it. If A is very sparse, then you might have an easier way to solve this problem. But without any structure on A, you know what a sparse matrix is like? Most of the entries are zero, some of them are non-zero. So if you remove that sparsity structure, then I don't know if you can come up with an easier way of doing this projection. Okay, so now that there are no more questions, let's jump right into the methods for solving constraint optimization problems. Okay, we have developed all the tools to do constraint optimization. So let's look into it. So the usual gradient descent was xk plus 1 equals xk plus alpha k dk. That was unconstrained optimization. Okay, so I am, so in the unconstrained case, I am in a space, I am at point xk, I can pick any direction I want. I can move in that direction and I will be within the space itself, within the set itself, right? Because it's unconstrained, I can move in any direction. Now the question is, when we have constrained optimization, what are the directions? What are the feasible directions? What are the directions in which I can move without worrying about going out of the set? Okay, so the question is, what are feasible directions? So now I am in a set, I want to make it a convex set. Okay, I'm in a set, convex set, capital X, I'm at a point XK, and I want to know what are the set of all possible DKs starting at this point. So these are all possible DKs. Is there an easy way to denote the set of all feasible directions if I'm standing at XK? Any thoughts? Yes. But, but my question is more, so even before you do that, my question is, what are the possible set of all feasible directions at xk? Okay, so if I'm in a space, if I'm in a subspace like this, I'm standing here, this is my xk, the feasible directions are sliding along the plane, but not going out of the plane, right? So, yes. So could we say something like, hey, all dk such that uh, xk plus 1, uh, so that the projection of, of xk plus alpha k dk equals xk plus alpha k dk. Well, yes, that's one way of doing it, but that's uh, pretty complicated. Any thoughts? Yeah. It's the set of all displacement vectors between xk and some other element of x. That's yeah, so you're getting there. So the set of all feasible directions, let me denote it by, what should I denote it by? F at xk is actually x minus xk 
x in capital X. Okay. So basically, the, the, the idea is if, if I go in the direction of dk, I'm going to reach a point within the convex set itself. So I can define the set of all feasible directions as x minus xk, where x is a point in that particular convex set. Now one of the things that we did in unconstrained optimization was unconstrained case, we wanted gradient of f at xk transpose dk to be strictly less than zero, right? And what did this yield? This implied that f of xk plus alpha k dk is strictly less than f of xk for alpha k small. This was the rationale for picking a direction dk. As long as this, this equation is satisfied, we are happy because we know if we take a small step in the direction dk, I'm going to reduce the value of the function. Now we want to extend this concept to the convex set, to the case of constraint optimization where the constraints are given by a convex set. So that would still hold true in this particular problem, where if I take a descent direction dk and my inner product between the gradient and dk is less than zero, I take a small step in that direction, I'm going to reduce my function. So this forms the basis. So now I have to merge this particular dk with this particular uh, feasible direction, and I get, a, uh, I get a way to solve constrained optimization problem. I need to find x bar k such that gradient of f at xk transpose x bar k minus xk is strictly less than zero. Oh, by the way, x bar k should be in the set itself. Okay, questions? This is the most important concept within constrained optimization. Okay, particularly, not particularly, but the one in which you are minimizing a function over a convex set. Okay, this is what we want. Now, how do you pick alpha k once you know, let's say somebody gave you such an x bar k or gave you an algorithm that finds such an x bar k that satisfies this expression. How do you pick alpha k? Well, alpha k can be picked according to the same things we studied in the previous unconstrained optimization case. You can have limited minimization rule, you can use Armijo's rule, or you can use a constant step size, okay? You know, one of the things that I see in the book, whenever they, Whenever the author writes constant step size, it uses alpha k equals one. But typically, at least in practice, for algorithms that I have implemented, alpha k equals one seems to be a very large number. So we typically use alpha k equals 0 0.01 or 0 0.05, and that seems to work better, okay? So even though you might be reading the book and the author says you can use constant step size and step size should be equal to one, uh, Sometimes it may not work and you might have to reduce 
the step size so that your uh, algorithm doesn't blow up. And you will see a similar thing happening in your assignment two, problem number two. Yeah. Oh, this is just the. Yeah, within the set where. Yes. Yes, arbitrary point. No, it has nothing to do with xk. So x bar k is not related to xk. All it says is x bar k is some point within the convex head, wherein if you move in this direction, you are going to ensure that the function achieves the value lower than the value at xk itself. Yes. Right. Right. Okay. So we borrowed this concept from unconstrained optimization that descent direction should satisfy this constraint. And so we rewrote it for the constraint case in this particular fashion. Now, now understanding this, what is the simplest thing you could do to find a value of x bar k? when you are sitting at xk. OK, so the question is, I want to find an x bar k such that this equation holds. What would you do? What's the simplest thing one could do? Yeah. The origin, of the like origin? No, center point is not well defined. Any thoughts? Yes. Uh, no, I don't quite get what you are saying. Any other idea? Set. Okay, you went two steps ahead. <laughs> that is something we will do. Okay, but uh, uh, that's called gradient projection method. Okay, the 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 simpler thing to do is solve x bar k equals argmin x in capital X. X minus XK. Okay, so if there is a feasible direction, the argument is always going to be strictly negative. Now I'm sure some of you will have questions. Yes. How do we guarantee that that is the most useful direction for us to be traveling in? And because before we've been doing stuff with uh, the second derivative of, of f at xk, uh -huh. and now we're just trying to minimize one expression that we isn't involved in that. Right. Uh, this does not guarantee that you will get the best direction to descend in. But what this does guarantee is if you get a solution out of this problem, it will satisfy this expression or it will be equal to zero. If it is equal to zero, then it means you are at a stationary point. That's what gradient descent method would be able to do. And if you're not at a stationary point, if xk is non-stationary, you will be able to find a descent direction uh, with this. Of course, it, uh, this would be, so you want the minimum to be strictly less than zero. Only in that case, this is a descent direction. If it is greater than, if the minimum of this expression is greater than or equal to zero, then it means you are standing at a stationary point, and that's probably a local minimum, unless you look for some sufficient condition to ascertain that it's indeed a local minimum. This way of picking x bar k is known as conditional gradient. gradient 
method and this is also known as Frank Wolf method. And if your algorithm converges, then it always converges to a stationary point. Yes. So uh, we had a bunch of formulas originally to get DK. Uh, yes. Using yes. Uh, Newton or quasi-Newton methods. Yes. Uh, why don't we just uh, use those values and then say it has to be equal to x minus sk, and we know what xk is? Does that give us anything using to use for x? So let me go to the next method, which is gradient projection method, okay. and then you will probably get an answer to your question. Any other question on this? Yes. So I think I'm confused because we're trying to develop gradient descent to solve constrained optimization problems. So yes. This itself is constrained optimization problem. Yes. So that's circular. Very good. That's the question I wanted. Okay. So you started with an optimization problem, minimize function over a con constraint set, uh, over a set X, and then we get to solving another optimization problem at every step, okay? We get to solve another optimization problem over the same constraint set. So this seems like a pretty bad idea, right? Well, it turns out that the original problem was uh, some weird looking function over a convex set. This is a linear function linear objective function over the convex set, okay? Now, of course, we haven't done linear programming yet, so we don't know if uh, solving this is easy or difficult, but it turns out that linear, solving linear programs are much easier than solving a very complicated non-convex program, okay? So what this method is trying to do is having a very complicated objective function, you have a very complicated objective function, you transform the original minimization problem to a sequence of linear programming problem and then descend at every time. And if your algorithm converges, then it converges to a stationary point. And if your function f is convex, then you know that you are at a global minimum within the convex set. Okay? So you are simplifying Simplifying nonlinear optimization to linear uh, optimization over convex set. Okay, and if your set looks good, solving the linear program is much easier than solving the original nonlinear program. Let's look at, yeah. And we're saying it's a nonlinear problem because we don't have original bounds on what f of x is? What do you mean original bound on f of x? O original statement for the original minimization problem. Yes, so in the original minimization problem, all I'm telling you is minimize the function mm -hmm. over a set. Uh, now you don't know which direction to move. Where is it that you're going to minimize your function? But in this case, all this is saying is if you move in this direction, this direction, you're likely to minimize your function as long as this is, the minimum value is less than zero. Okay. If it is greater than or equal to zero, then you are at a stationary point. Yes? So, you cannot take arbitrarily large steps, right? Take your alpha has to be somehow. Yes. Taken care of. That also has to be a constraint of your equation. So, Typically, people would use alpha k as constant 0 0.1 or 0 0.01. Or you could use Armio's rule if your function evaluation is cheap. You could use Armio's rule to pick alpha k. Or you could also solve a limited minimization problem to compute alpha k. But none of them would guarantee that your new x k plus 1 would be in the set. 
No, it will guarantee. Uh, well, okay, yes. So your alpha k has to be less than or equal to one, right? If your alpha k is very large, then yes, you, there's no way you can guarantee. Okay, so alpha k less than or equal to one. Well, it's not necessary, right? You could have alpha k equals 1.02 and it might still be within the set, but uh, yeah, you just have to be cautious when picking a value of alpha k. Okay, so the next topic is gradient projection method. Yes. So, so, based off the choice of alpha k, is there a way to construct a proof that we don't leave the convex set? Because if we can't prove that we don't leave... So, as long as your alpha k is less than equal to 1, mm -hmm. you will never be leaving the convex set at all. Okay. So, otherwise, it yeah. just get the projection operator on top right. of it because right. it's not going to make a difference. So, next topic is gradient projection method, which is something that one of your friends mentioned earlier. So I take x bar k equals x k minus s k the gradient of f at x k projection and then I use x k plus 1 equals Now, SK is between 0 and how large can you make your SK? Let me write 1, but it, it's not necessary that SK be less than 1, 1 included. Okay, so what you are doing here in this particular expression you have your convex set, capital X. You are standing at XK. You take a small step using the steepest descent. Okay, so this is the steepest descent. So I take a small step. This is my negative gradient of FXK. This is a small step in that direction and then I project it. So this is my x bar of k. Yes? Is there anything that can be done to simplify the projection work since uh, so we're essentially going to take the projection of xk minus something of minus xk uh, or is is the way the operators going no, to work this is, us from doing it. This is the only way to do it. Okay. There's no other simplification you can do. Unless you know that this entire thing already lies in the set itself, in which case you don't have to. Then you are just doing a regular gradient descent. Mm -hmm. Okay, now some of you mentioned that you could take the second derivative inverse, you could do quasi-Newton method, or you could do things like that. Uh, the problem is that the benefit of those methods is not very apparent when you have constraints. Okay, In an unconstrained world, yes, all of those methods really help you a lot. In the constrained world, it's not very clear whether you will get any advantage of using the second uh, using second order methods or not. Even though we will talk about Newton's method uh, in some time, which is another form of gradient projection method. Okay, but it's written slightly differently. It's not the same as this gradient projection method. <clears throat> 
Okay? So what you are doing is, you start at xk, you go in the direction of negative gradient fxk, and then you project, and then you move in this direction. You move in this direction according to alpha k. Okay? And then you reach somewhere, and then you again take the derivative, and then again take the projection, and then keep moving along the boundary. If you are at the boundary, if you are in the interior, then of course you can move in any direction as long as you are within the interior, you remain within the interior of the set. Okay? So in this, in a two-dimensional plane, in a 3D space, Okay, you are restricted to just slide along the plane. Okay, but you can't go out of the plane. So just in case if the gradient takes you out of the plane, then you project it back onto the plane itself, and then you move along that direction. And then you continue this process over and over again. If it converges, then you satisfy the first order condition for optimality. Not first order, but the necessary condition for optimality for convex set. Do we have uh, a way to conceptualize this if we go outside the set, wrapping around down and, and appearing in a different place on the set that's not immediately contiguous? It's like a, some equivalent of a modulus operation. And but are you talking about a convex set or are you talking about non-convex set? On the convex set, do we have some idea for uh, us not solely being kept the boundary where uh, we could attempt to get to the interior of the set in a way uh, that was well defined and so oh, it wouldn't be doing anything weird like having these randomness to get there? No, I think, uh, so since you're talking about a convex set, you're talking about a differentiable function, and you're talking about sk being small enough, you will always be within the contiguous region around the xk, around the point xk that you started with. You won't be going very far off, unless your sk was too large. Okay, so let's take that example. Here are you, xk, and you take sk equals 1000 or something. Right? Then any projection, I don't know, would lead you to somewhere here. In which case, yes, you are not in the immediate neighborhood. You are far off from xk, but that requires xk to be pretty large. Okay. Now, in this particular algorithm, you need to pick sk and you need to pick alpha k. Okay. So, there was a question in the back. Oh, with this, so if you pick your SK appropriately and you're not at a stationary point, then you're always descending. But you're not in the direction of the gradient. We have projected it somewhere, so you don't know where it will land. You don't know where it will land. That's a good point. Oh, in this case. Well, yes, so I picked an SK that's very large. Yeah. So as long as your SK is small, you remain within the neighborhood of XK. And this is imitating the gradient method, the gradient descent method for the case where you have a convex set. So remember that in gradient descent, uh, there are all these possible directions where you can descend, right? It's, you will still satisfy the gradient of f at xk transpose dk is less than zero, right? But then there are these other areas where your dk might have a positive inner product with the gradient. So in this particular case, in this case, what you're saying is, let me go in this direction for a little bit and then project it back onto the set, in which case I will probably be either in this direction or in this direction. I won't be very far off that I will have to go in this direction where you cannot ascertain whether you are in the descent direction or not. Okay. 
Yes. So the projection operator, when we're not in one of these well-defined convex sets, uh, it's, is itself a constrained optimization problem? Um, is it similarly an easier fair, um, optimization problem, or do we wind up going down the same route? Now, now, in the previous case, you didn't have to do projection, right? So there you had to solve a linear function over a convex set. Here you have to do a projection. So now you have the computation. You have to make the computational trade-off between whether solving the linear problem is easier than this, or whether projection is easier than solving the linear problem. Okay. Now if your set is extremely weird, then we will talk about it in the Lagrangian methods. Okay. Where if your constraints are given by some nonlinear uh, functions being equal to something or less than equal to something. So then we talk about Lagrangian methods. These methods will not help you there. All right, uh, so let's stop here and we will talk about, continue our discussion on gradient projection next, week, next time.